Good morning. Uh, as Sharon said, my name is Stephen Fagan, and I'm the oral historian here at the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. Does anybody know what oral history is? Any of you want to want to make a guess? Yeah. What do you think? It's exactly right. It's, it's, it's the, the sharing of firsthand knowledge verbally. And my job at the museum is to manage our ongoing oral history project. Uh, for almost 20 years now, we've been collecting people's memories of November 22nd, 1963, when the president was shot. We have over 550 interviews in the archives, and we've talked to a wide range of people like eyewitnesses who actually saw the assassination, doctors from Parkland Hospital that worked on the president, police officers, and members of the news media. And we're very honored today to be doing an oral history live right here in front of you. And, and Vivian and I are going to talk for a few minutes, and then I'm going to let you guys become oral historians and ask questions of Vivian. And we are videotaping this, and this, this interview today will become part of the museum's oral history collection. And so I encourage you to be thinking of relevant questions. Think about questions which might help research researchers or historians or students a hundred years from now when all of us are gone because that's what the value of oral history is. It preserves this information for future generations. So be thinking of questions today as we talk and then you guys will get to become oral historians yourself. I want to welcome Vivian Castleberry. Uh, she was the longtime head of the Women's News Department at the Dallas Times Herald newspaper. And you're in for a real treat because this is literally a living legend. She is a longtime community leader and, uh, and one of the true legends of Dallas journalism. And so please join me in welcoming Vivian Castleberry here today. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, well, Vivian, you had an assignment the day of the president's visit to Dallas. What was that? I did. Uh, I was a member of the press, and I want to go back just a little bit and tell you that those of us who were covering the story had been carefully, carefully checked out by the FBI and the Secret Service and every other thing that you can possibly think about. So I felt really good when I was issued badge number 18 to cover the Kennedy visit to Dallas. Uh, there were a great many, I mean, at the Times Herald, as, as with all of the other press, the media communications in Dallas, everybody was holding sessions to tell us how to behave, what to do, what our assignments were, where we should be, where we should stand. So we had had three different sessions at my newspaper about that. My specific assignment was to cover Jackie Kennedy, the first lady, from the time she arrived in Dallas, uh, and then cover her through the weekend, because the Kennedys were going from Dallas after their visit here to uh, the LBJ Ranch, Lyndon Johnson's Ranch, <coughs> and uh, spend the weekend. And so I was to be a part of the press corps that was covering all of those things. At the last minute, the weather became so bad that we had just a bit of a switch in how we should handle things. So we sent Val M., who was my society editor on my staff, to Love Field to meet the President and First Lady when they arrived here. And I was to pick them up then at the trademark. And the trademark was the place where the big luncheon was to be held. So. The day had dawned really bad. It, uh, it was um, um, cloudy, it was dark, it was stormy, not quite as stormy as it was here last night, but not too, not too bright a day. <clears throat> and uh, many of the people at Love Field, when they first got out there, stood in the rain. And the, the, the uh, entourage from Love Field into downtown Dallas to this part and then on to the trademark was to be a complete 10 mile route. And people throughout this entire 10 miles were lining the sides of the street to see the President and First Lady when they came by. So now I'm back at the Dallas trademark. I get there very early because I want to feel the atmosphere in that room before the people arrive that I'm about to cover for the day. I go down and check the head table. It's draped in olive green kind of satin. There are garlands of, of uh, greenery around the table. 
and the name plates are all on the table and I may have the only uh, complete listing of the head table that's in existence. I don't know that because I haven't checked everybody else. But I do know that I have a complete list in order of the people who were sitting, 15 of them sitting at the head table. Our assignment was that once we are in our places, before the President and First Lady and the other dignitaries arrive, that we are to be in our places and we are not to move from those places because the FBI has to keep up with all of us. And keeping up with 2,400 people is not that easy. So I, I, as I said, I probably was the first one there and I walked through all of the tables. They were on two levels because the guest list kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, they had all of those of us at the press were just inside. Let's let's say that this is a, 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 the uh, the trademark dining room, and the press tables were over here to the extreme right. And of course, that's where I was sitting over on the extreme right with the other press people. And the time came for the president and first lady to arrive and they didn't arrive, and we waited, and we waited, and there was suddenly, among all this great crowd, a murmuring. People began to get kind of restless. The waiters and servers had already put in front of us our lunch, great giant Texas steaks, <laughs> and <clears throat> everything was all, everybody was there, in place except for the front head table that was empty. And suddenly there was a great clamoring to the right. And I looked up behind me. I was sitting to where my back was to the opening where the press corps was to come in from Washington, D.C., the press corps that was traveling with the president and the other dignitaries. And as they, the door opened and they started to flood in, you could look at their faces and know that something had happened. And so I sat there and I remember I sat and I saw the, the Dallas Times Herald head of our press, Bob Hollingsworth, walk through the door. He was headed to the telephones as fast as he could go, as were all of the other press people were trying to get a telephone. There was a bank of telephones just to our the front of us. And so I sat and I was, wasn't supposed to move and I would try to get up. Then I would sit back down and then I would get up. And finally, when I saw Bob Hollingsworth face, I could not follow instructions anymore. So I got up from my seat and followed him to the telephone. He had just got a telephone. All the press corps was buying for the few telephones that were in service there. And he turned to me and said, Vivian, the president is dead. And so that was my first awareness that not only had something awful happened, but something so dramatic that never again would Dallas be the same. So that's kind of the beginning of that first day and the coverage of the story. That's just the start of it. Well, we have a picture of the trademark. Corey, can we see that real quick? There is the luncheon there. And if you look at that arrow uh, on the far side, there is Vivian as part of the crowd there at the luncheon. Uh, can we zoom in on that? The next slide, please. There she is in red. Now, Vivian, I notice in this picture that everyone else seems to have bowed their heads in prayer, and you're writing in your notebook. I was taking notes. <laughs> That's what a reporter does. You take notes of everything that is going on. And when you look at this picture, I've got to tell you a story that's kind of a sideline story. I have a grandson who was just a little bit younger than, than you young people are today, who came down and toured the museum. And I said to him, now, Austin, when you get there, uh, you're going to see this big colored photograph. And you will look to your extreme left, and you will see a woman in red who is taking notes and that's me. 
And so later he came over and he said to me, Grandmommy, that couldn't have been you. Your hair is not the right color. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we do change as we go along. <laughs> now, when, when it was announced to the group that there had been an accident, that the president was shot, uh -huh. what was the mood like at the trademark among the, the people? Absolutely stunned. You could have heard there were 2,400 people in that hall, and you could have heard a pin drop. It, uh, except for the press corps, the Washington press corps, who was on the telephones in front of us, there was not a breath, there was not a movement in that building. I want to digress, go back for just a minute, to say that uh, as the people had begun to come in that day, I had interviewed the different dignitaries when I saw them come into the luncheon. And I saw Judge Sarah Hughes come in. And when she came in, I interviewed her and I said to her, what do you think is going to happen today? And she said to me, I will be so glad when the president is out of town. I don't feel comfortable about his being here. So I wrote that down in my notes. And incidentally, Steve, the, those notes are the only reporter's notes that I kept throughout time. I now turn them over to you so you have them together with my press badge and other events of the day. But Judge Hughes was not comfortable, as were some of the other Dallas uh, dignitaries who were covering. But the mood had been so festive. People, as most of you have heard, uh, First, uh, Texas First Lady Nellie Conley had just said to President Kennedy just before he was shot, you can't say that Texas doesn't love you. And so anyway, you ask, and I'm digressing and not <laughs> answering your question, but at, at, then suddenly people began to move. And one of the things that, that I made note of at the time. There were 2,400 steaks, dinners, that were scooped up and thrown away after that event. Nobody could eat a bite, of course. We moved very, I, I moved to the telephone with Bob Hollingsworth, and from the time that he took over that telephone and was feeding information back to our paper, he would talk for a while, and then I would take over and let him go out and do some more research, and I would go back, and he would come back and take over the phone and report what he had seen. And after everybody had finally left, I was still there doing the aftermath kind of cleanup reporting, and I walked into the room that was to the front of the trademark and to one side where a temporary office had been set up for the president and first lady. And they had done a replica of the chair that he sat in at his office in Washington. The red telephone was on the desk that he would use for any kind of critical messages that he was supposed to get. There were wrapped birthday gifts on the table for the two children, for uh, Caroline and Jack Jack, who was just about to both of the children were about to have a birthday in November. In fact, uh, the little boy was going to turn three, just three days after his father was assassinated. So the rat birthday presents were there. And I got pictures of that, and I got that firmly in my brain about what kind of preparations had been made for an event that would never take place. And uh, so after that, as people began to move out, and they moved out quietly. Yeah, 2,400 people do not move quietly, right? <laughs> they moved out very quietly, and the murmuring was uh, subdued. The questioning was subdued. You could hear a sob now and then as people filed out because uh, Dr. Luther Holcomb, who at that time was the head of the, uh, of the uh, Christians uh, Association in Dallas, said, said the prayer that dismissed us. Uh, J. Eric Johnson, who was the mayor, made a few remarks, and then we were dismissed to go our separate ways. 
And after everybody had gone, and I had gone into this room and had found the birthday presents, had found the room waiting for the Kennedys, I went out and got in my car and made my way back to the paper where I've got to tell you there was organized chaos. <laughs> and I do mean organized. And one of the things that I've always been very proud of is that all of the separation that the press does in, in getting ready to cover a major event, it was like watching a well-greased performance take place. Everybody was doing her job or his job. And we were told immediately that the foreign press was going to be coming in soon. There were going to be people from all over. Press from all over the nation would be arriving quickly as soon as they could get air flight to Dallas and that we should treat them as our friends and we should let them uh, use our telephones and our desks and our offices. And so one of the hardest things that I had to do was to sit there while somebody was sitting at my desk and using my telephone and giving erroneous information and feeding it back to their paper. For instance, they were misidentifying buildings, they were misidentifying streets, but I, you just kept quiet and let each person do his or her own thing. Uh, in the meantime, I got a telephone call through not many telephone calls were coming through. They were mostly going out. But I got a telephone call from my first cousin who worked right near this building in downtown Dallas. She was the assistant to Abraham Zapruder, who took those one photographs that all of you have seen at one time or another. Um, and she was standing by him and handing uh, ha had uh, some of the film that he was going to be using in his camera later. And when the telephone rang, and I picked it up, and she said, Vivian, this is Peggy. And I saw a president die today. And I said, don't say another word until I put a piece of paper in my typewriter. So I typed her story uh, just exactly as she told it to me about standing with beside Abraham Zapruder and watching the whole thing take place. So all of those notes are now a part of your record mm -hmm. here at this museum. I want to show something from our archives right now. Corey, can we see the next slide? Now this is a Western Union telegram that I believe you received that afternoon from a friend of yours in Canada. Tell me what she was asking. Uh, I had been at Columbia University for a press conference with some of the outstanding uh, editors throughout this country and this one person and the only person there in that group was from Sault Ste. Marie, Canada. And she uh, wired me that afternoon, asked me if I could please wire her paper 300 words about what Dallas was like that night after the assassination. And uh, so after I had wrapped up everything I could do that day at the paper. I had even been a gopher. I had gone out and gotten sandwiches for some of the people who were working the main story. And uh, so then after I had done everything I could, and this was close on to midnight, probably 11 o'clock or so, 11 to 11.30, I put on my coat and I decided to walk the streets of Dallas before I wired the story back to Nan in Sault Ste. Marie, Canada about what Dallas was really like. I wanted it to be authentic. So I walked, uh, the Times Herald was on Pacific Street, I walked from Pacific Street all the way up to Harwood, down Harwood and to Commerce and then back down toward my paper and passed, of course, the, um, the Carousel Club that Jack Ruby owned. Had no idea at the time that that would be a part of history. But, uh, oh, and let me digress just a minute. I okay. keep interrupting myself. But uh, <laughs> one of the things that I do want to be sure and tell you is that I also, when I got back to the paper call, Judge Sarah Hughes. So I, and she answered her own telephone at home. 
So I was the last person to speak with her before she swore in the president and the first person to speak with her after she swore in the president. And I said to her, what was it like on Air Force One to be swearing in a president? And she said, oh, it was just my job. <laughs> Lyndon asked me to do it, and of course, I was very happy to do it. So I just went down there and did what I was asked to do. She didn't seem to take any uh, particular, uh, had had no particular joy. Of course, the thing is, I think she had known, quote, Lyndon all of his life. <laughs> and, uh, so she was ready to do anything you wanted her to do. Let's look at some of those pictures and you can kind of talk us through the trip you made down the streets of Dallas. You had a photographer with you that yes, night. I did. Let's see the next slide, Corey. Now there's a gentleman uh, looking in a, sh in a store window and you can see the headline on the newspaper, President Dead. Yeah. Tell me what you remember as we, as we cycle well, through these pictures. The thing is, as we cycle through the pictures, it just brings back, I, uh, uh, Stephen showed these to me a few minutes ago and I was literally taken back to that night because it, it was a blustery night. The wind was blowing, the papers were blowing up and down the street. There was not, there was, there were so few cars moving as to almost say there was nothing at all. It was a blustery, wintry night. All of the social events had been canceled. There were two major social events that were to have taken place that night. Both had been canceled. Uh, people were in their homes. There were a very few people on the street, and those that were there apparently were going to jobs that they could not afford not to go to. But for the most part, it was, and I think the headline on my story said, Dallas is a ghost town tonight. That was a story that I sent back to Nan. It was a ghost town. There was just nothing happening. Everything was in just in in gridlock that evening the expressions on like the expression on that fellow's face he he clearly is upset and he's slouched down in his seat do you remember where that picture was taken it looks like in the lobby of a hotel i think it may be in the lobby of a hotel i went just i didn't go into many buildings along the way there weren't any buildings open really everything was closed and i think that must have been in the lobby of the Adolphus Hotel. I'm not really sure where it was. Next slide, Corey. And there's the Carousel there's Club. There's the Carousel Club. What it doesn't show you is the front door. And the front door, which would be just adjacent to where you see this glamour girl over here, the front door had a wreath on it. And again, I did not know what that was going to indicate later, but, but I did make note of the fact that, yes, here was the Carousel Club closed, closed down for the night. It's worth noting that the Carousel Club closed in memory of President Kennedy, and it never reopened because is that right? <laughs> because Ruby, uh, Ruby then shot oh, Oswald, right. and the Carousel Club remained closed. Uh, next slide, please. And there's a city bus. That's a city bus. Those very few people who were having any transportation at all were on the city buses. And they, too, it seemed to me, were moving at a crawling space down the streets. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to give you guys a chance to ask uh, Ms. Castleberry some questions. I'll ask one final question. Sure. Tell me what happened when you finally got to go home later that night, or really early the next morning, I guess, after a full day. It's about 2 o'clock in the morning. And my mother had come up here from East Texas into my house because I had small children. My, the youngest of my five children was barely three years old. And my mother had come up to be the mainstay with my children that weekend while I was at the ranch covering a story for my paper. And um, when I walked in that night, my mother was sitting up. She was the only one up. She was, uh, my husband had gone to bed. Everybody else had gone to bed. And mother said to me, you better go talk to your daughter. Now I have to background just a little bit to tell you that my oldest daughter was 13, almost 14. And for weeks, she had wanted to go see the president when he came to Dallas. The schools had decreed that the children were not to be let out 
to see, to go to any of the events unless they were accompanied by a parent. Well, my husband was a school teacher. There was no way he could get off and escort her to downtown Dallas. I was a newspaper reporter. There was no way I could escort her. But together we made up our mind that this was so important to this child that we must allow her to come. So she had come downtown with me that morning, and I had taken home the clippings from our library at the Times Herald and on the way to downtown Dallas from our home in suburban Dallas back to the paper that morning before daylight on, on November the 22nd, Carol had read me uh, clippings from that file by, by flashlight. <laughs> she had had her flashlight, and she was so that I would be updated on Jackie Kennedy and know what kind of questions to ask when I finally got to interview her. Well, I parked Carol, my daughter, right on the corner of the A. Harris department store. She was the only one there. This was just shortly after daylight in the morning. The crowds had not begun, uh, started to assemble yet, but she sat there with her books and studied, and the, the uh, understanding was that as soon as the president's motorcade comes by, then you are to walk across this street up to this bus stop, get on this bus, which will take you back to school. That's what she did. So she heard the shots. So now I'm back to that night. I go into her bedroom. She is lying in bed. She has finally fallen asleep. She has cried herself to sleep. Her face is all swollen. And I sit beside her wondering if I should wake her. I simply laid my hand on her shoulder. And, and what I had really intended to do is to lay my hand on her shoulder, kiss her goodnight, and, and walk away. And suddenly, she, she just lifted herself out of bed, threw herself in my arms, put her arms around me, and said, Mother, his hair was red in the sunlight, and he looked right at me. And that's when I came apart. All day long, I had been a reporter covering a story. But when my child responded to what had happened to her that day, that's when I'd had it, and that's when I literally came apart, it seems. And we held each other for a long time with both of us sobbing. Carol then, within the last two years, I think, came down and did her story for you. Mm -hmm. She walked across that street to the bus stop. She heard the shots. She thought it was a car backfiring. She did not know what had happened until she walked into her school. And she said, and Mother, everything was dead quiet. And then I heard the word assassination. And I did not think I would ever see or hear that word except in a history book. So that's the story. Yes, ma'am. My mother and I were in Fort Worth, and we got to see him close up, close enough to almost shake his hand. And so it was a real shock. And every time I tell the story of seeing him, I cry. And I, I'm homeschooled by children. I've told them this. Do you cry like that? Do other people? Oh, yes. Yes, you saw, you saw me almost come apart was when I was telling my daughter's story. And, and she and I can sit down together and recall that day in vivid detail. And we are both in tears again. It was a, a story that, as I have told many people, I would not have been anywhere else in the world that day except where I was. But God help me, I never want to live that kind of story again. Other questions? Yes, far back. How many, how many shots did Carol hear? Two shots. She thought the car was backfiring. Yes, ma'am. Do you think Oswald acted alone or do you think there was a conspiracy? I do not think there was a conspiracy. It is so easy as we watch things happen afterward 
to layer on all of the different kinds of things that we hear and we think and it could have been this, it could have been that. I have read the Warren Report. I have lived the story all of these years. I think that Oswald fired the shot and I know that Jack Ruby fired the shot that killed Oswald. So I don't think there, I think it was a whole series of things that we can always ask what if, or we can always redo history, but that isn't our role to do. We take every fact that we possibly can, and we accept that then as what really took place. Mm -hmm. That's the way I feel. You knew Jack Ruby, didn't you? I did. Jack Ruby was one of those colorful characters who always came to the paper. I think that he thought if, if he came often enough that we were probably going to do a big story on him. So, <laughs> so he, he was there fairly often. I didn't know him personally, but he would go around and shake all the reporters' hands. And I think what he intended to do was to charm some of us to the point to where we do a big feature story on him. I'm sure that my editors would have not sat still for that, but uh, he, <laughs> so because I knew him and because he had been at the paper so often, I was one of the people who was subpoenaed to testify when he came to trial. Well, of course, he never came to trial, but um, also, one of the sideline things, just a sideline thing that you may be interested in knowing, is that I knew Henry Wade and his family very well. Uh, Henry Wade was the district attorney. They were members of our church, and I taught his kids in Sunday school, and he taught mine. And this is a sideline story, just a complete sideline story, but one day, one of my kids, who was probably the age of one of you younger boys, was in my Sunday school class, and he was really acting up that day. And Henry decided, Henry Wade decided that day, for some reason or other, that he would come visit my class. So he came in, <laughs> and this kid was literally climbing the walls. He was out of control, and I couldn't do anything with him. And Henry said to me, Miss Castleberry, would you like for that boy to sit down? And I said, well, it would be nice if he would. So Henry took him by the back of the neck and the seat of the pants and put him in a chair and said, now you sat there. <laughs> and that boy didn't move for the rest of the class. Well, on uh, the Sunday morning, after uh, the Kennedy assassination and after the killing, and all this stuff had taken place, I felt a real, real need for some spiritual renewal. So I got up on Sunday morning and went to church and sat in the same pew. I was along here and Henry was down. My family did not go with me. They were still in front of the television, still in tears. Everybody was glued to the television. All the families were. You were, right? All weekend you were glued to that TV watching. And uh, so I was there alone and Henry was at uh, sitting at the end of the pew and I was kind of midway up and before the service ended someone came down and whispered in his ear and he very quietly got up and went up the aisle and I knew something had happened so I followed him out of the church service got in my car and drove to the paper and that's when I walked in uh, people were beginning to gather this Sunday morning uh, reporters, editors had already started gathering, and Bob um, Jackson, who took that famous Pulitzer Prize winning shot, got off the elevator, and all of the editors, the male editors, were standing around saying, what did you get? What did you get? And he said, I won't know till I get it developed. <laughs> so they go to the dark room, they start to develop the picture, and as soon as the images come out, you could have heard the screaming for six blocks in this city. He had the shot, exact shot, where uh, Ruby fi fired the shot that killed Oswald. Mm. So, anyway. We have time for one more question. Is there another question for Ms. Castleberry? Yes, sir. 
I don't know if you can answer that. He was wanting to know, did Jack Ruby like John F. Kennedy? I have no idea. You never know what other people think or feel, and sometimes you have to be very careful not to layer on what other people are thinking or feeling. So I, I have a <laughs> feeling that he, that Jack Ruby, this is what, what I think, and remember, I don't know, but what I think is that, that Jack Ruby felt by Kennedy like a lot of the rest of the country felt that he was the new salvation for this country. And because he was, he became something of a godlike figure, uh, larger than life for many of us. And he was young, he was, uh, he was uh, moving out in ways that former presidents had not moved out. He uh, was, he, he was the, the promise. He was the promise of the future. And I heard one of your teachers say earlier to you very quietly, we don't know what would have happened if Kennedy had lived. What we do know is that Lyndon Johnson then became president of the United States and carried out most of the policies that Kennedy had formulated, including the Civil Rights Movement, the EEOC, the Women's Liberation Movement, all of the freedoms that had been outlined in the campaign that elected Kennedy as president were carried out by his successor. And one other thing that I think is fascinating, uh, during that campaign, maybe some of you are old enough to remember, when, when Kennedy got the nomination in, for president instead of Johnson, all of those of us who felt like we were pundits and who could answer a lot of the questions said, oh, Johnson will never take the role of vice president to Kennedy. And he did. <laughs> so <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. I wish I could answer your question, but it's a good question, and we'll just think about it. All right. Well, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Vivian Castleberry for being with us today. Thank you.